Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, amazing God, we've come to rejoice and to be glad because you've done enough already by January 3rd for us to realize how good you are. Now, Lord, if I know life the way I know life, there are going to be some ups and downs in this year, some challenges we face, some crises we didn't see coming. Some of us will find ourselves in the midst of tragedy that was unexpected. But I pray right now, O oh God, that you'd speak to us in such a way that we would find the strength we need to believe that our God is with us. And the old saints used to say, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. So God, be with us in this moment, in our hearing, our thinking, and our understanding, that all that we say and do would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Before we get started, I want to share with you a little bit about how tonight's lesson came to be. Like many of you coming to the end of the year, it's a time of internal reflection, a time of prayer, a time of discerning, a time of wondering what God has in store. And like many of you, I come to the end of every year believing that better is in store. As a matter of fact, that's, that's the hope that holds me. Um, there's no way in the world I want 2018 to be worse than 2017. Um, if that were the case, God could have called me home to glory on New Year's Eve after my last mimosa and we would have had a good time um, in Jesus' name. Um, but we always expect and believe, and I believe that God is a God of greater things, that he says, eyes haven't seen what I have in store. Isaiah 43, that God wants to do a new thing. Uh, but in contemplating that in devotional, one of the things I continue to go to in scripture is the journey of Israel into the promised land. And you recall that they had to wander for 40 years before they walked in. And if you begin to ask the question, why did God cause them to wander for 40 years? The answer is because there was a generation within them that did not believe God, and they had to die before God sent the second generation in. In a real sense, the makeup and nature of who they were had to change. So while they were wandering, God was holding the promised land until they changed. So God declares that there are new things I have, but they're not for you. They're for the new you. Right? That the old you cannot walk into the new things God has. So no matter what you believe and pray for and ask God to do in 2018, the reality is, is that you're not waiting on God. God is waiting on you. And the Lord sometimes speaks to me in some real kind of heavy ways. And the one thing I heard the Lord continuously say in my hearing as I meditated on that was, you know, even at this stage of life, pastor to church, the Lord says to me, you got to get your stuff together. You got to get your act together. You got to get your life together. Uh, that at a certain stage, you've got to realize you're too old to be making some of the same mistakes you made when you were young. Right? David says in Psalm 25, Lord, forgive the sins of my youth. That there's some sins that are more understandable at 25 than they are at 45. Um, and so hearing the Lord say to me, you know, you got to get stuff together. I went to the Kaya team. I said, listen, that, that's what the Lord's put on my heart. I want to talk about, you know, get, get your life together. Um, and they changed the title because we know that, that that was too close to another profane way of saying it that, that we didn't want getting out. <laughs> Amen. You ain't that saved. You, you, someone didn't hear get your life together. Someone heard, you got to get your... <laughs> Okay. That's what we've heard people say to us before. So uh, they want to change it uh, to fix my life. And so that's where we're going to begin our journey. Can we put the first slide up and I'll take it from there? Um, I want to talk about getting things right in 2018. Now, before we move, I want to acknowledge that this is blatantly uh, plagiarized from Jan Van Zant's show. Um, um, and fix my life. And I want to be clear that, that I am not purporting to be Yonler to have that wisdom, that advice. I I've, I've, don't like a lot of TV, don't like a lot of reality shows in particular. Um, I don't like things that highlight the ignorance of black people. It just, it just leaves a really bad taste in my mouth. 
Um, and this show is not really like that, but I did watch a couple of episodes getting ready um, for tonight, only to realize um, that a lot of people have a real bad misperception of how you make change. Um, because what I firmly believe is that no one can fix you but you. Um, and that's not to suggest that, that God can't, but God doesn't force change on you. God will change circumstances until you make a decision that you're going to change you. Um, so hear me, I don't come believing that I share anything tonight that's going to help you fix you, um, but you can make a decision that you want to fix you, that there are things you want to change in your life. Um, one of the very first things that helps you make a decision that you're going to change is the Lord creates within us a disgust over the current narrative of your life. Um, the one of the ways God initiates your desire to change you is to let you get sick and tired of where you are. And to reach a point where you're saying, you know what, I don't want to do it like this anymore. I don't want to go through this anymore. As a matter of fact, I believe crisis is one of God's way of putting a mirror in front of our face to have us examine who we really are and what we claim to be. Um, one of the reasons God allows trouble um, is really to disgust you, to reach you, make you reach a place where you're tired of it. Um, Bishop Walter Thomas said something to me once that I've held on to. He said, sometimes God has to let it get ugly for you to make a decision to get out. Right? That we don't always feel God in the sunshine, but we hear God in the rain. That we don't make decisions to change under pleasant circumstances, we make decisions to change when we feel the heat, when we decide that we want to change our lives. Um, and there's a quote by Craig Groeschel, a Christian writer, that led me to really think about my life. He said, am I living the story God wants to tell about me? Does the narrative of my life match God's story for who God wants me to be? Um, and when you begin to ask yourself that question, it will most times lead to a place of change when you realize that the way your life is happening is probably not the story God wants to tell. Um, and when I realize that I am not in that place, then I begin to discern where and how my life is misaligned with God's will. Um, change begins with me understanding that I'm not where God wants me to be and identifying in what areas, what stages, what places of my life, in my finances, in my relationships, with my children, with my family, uh, where are you misaligned with God? So after the disgust comes the discernment, and then comes the deliberate decision to make changes. Um, that's where many of us found ourselves December 31, 2017. I'm going to make some changes in my life. I don't want to live like this any longer. I realize where things are not in alignment. I'm doing well in my career, but in my personal life, things aren't where God wants them to be. Maybe in finances, I'm tracking well, but with friends, I'm not. Um, where am I going to make some changes? And then the final step is to be disciplined um, with where you feel God has called you to be. Um, there will be no change without discipline. Discipline is one of those words we don't use a lot in contemporary Christianity. Um, because it requires sacrifice, it requires saying no. Um, but without discipline, there'll be no change in your life. That's why we make resolutions on January 1 and before you know, Valentine's Day, you're already done with it. I saw a funny meme that was on Instagram today. It said, oh man, messed up already, but 2019 is my year, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm claiming 2019 in, in Jesus' name, you know? I'm three days in, and yeah, there you go. Um, so I want to reread in your hearing a passage of Scripture that we've looked at several times. It just once again reminds us of that reality of what happens when we're undisciplined. It's in Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read verse 15 through 25. You've heard it before. Paul says, for what I'm doing, I don't understand, and what I want to do, I don't practice, but what I hate is what I do. If I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good is there. I want to do what is good, but how to do it I don't find. 
the good that I want to do, I don't do, but the evil I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing all the time. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then the law that evil is present with me, even when I desire to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my flesh warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity of law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. Here's what Paul testifies to in Romans 7, a reality that all of us know. One of the most common experiences about being human. And that's the desire to make a change and do right and not be able to do it. That somehow having a convicted mind is not always enough to lead to a changed life. Because I want to change doesn't always mean that I can. And all of us in here know what it's like for God to put you in a crisis, in a tragedy, in a bad spot, and your prayer goes a little something like this. You've prayed it. Lord, I ain't even going to front. I ain't going to act like, like I ain't done nothing wrong. But if you get me out of this, I will never, ever, ever, ever do this again. And that conviction is sincere in that moment. And then you find out like Paul in Romans 7, and I wind right back up in the very thing I tell, anybody ever had that prayer? Anybody had that experience? If your neighbor doesn't have their hand up, they are a liar, and the truth of God <laughs> is nowhere within them. Um, we all have that experience. Um, that repeated cycle of commitment and failing, commitment and failing, conviction and failing, conviction and failing. And it doesn't mean that you have an addiction. It doesn't mean that you have a weakness. It doesn't mean you have a problem. It means that you're human, right? And that we struggle with certain things that sometimes get a hold of us. And it's easier to say we want to be changed than actually make the change. And I'll suggest to you that you reach the moment when you feel like life is falling apart. When you're determined to make a change, commit yourself to it. But you repeatedly fail at doing it. So this isn't something you experience the first time. But when you see yourself repeatedly falling into the same cycle, that's when you say, I got to get my life together. You know, if I slip once and convicted and changed, that's one thing. But when I find myself stumbling over this same thing time and time and time again, you reach that point where you're saying, listen, I, something's got to give. I got to make a change. Um, the tough part is the longer you're in this cycle of convicted, committed, fail, convicted, convicted committed, fail, convicted, committed, fail, the enemy starts to work on you and put you in this dilemma where you're trying to now choose between coping and changing. Because the longer I'm in it, the more the devil convinces me that I can't change. And when I can't change, I try to cope. I start to try to live with it. I try to find a way to integrate it into my life, to hide the dysfunctionality with functionality in other areas and hoping that if I'm good with A through D, but I mess up on E, but G through Z is all right, then everything in my life is fine. We try to find ways to cover the dysfunction. We try to find ways to live with it. We try to find ways to make peace with it. And what the devil ultimately does is cause us to lose our spirit of conviction. Right? So that when you've lost the spirit of conviction, now the sin, the problem, the struggle doesn't bother you. You're just trying to find ways to integrate into your life. Let me give you a prime example. <laughs> More often than not, if you're truly trying to grow in your walk with the Lord, and this isn't for everybody, and I'm not advocating this, but I'm just talking about what I'm talking about, because usually when I go down this road, I get emails from, from people, right? When you're growing with the Lord, more often than not, a sexual act with someone will convict you the next day. Yeah. You know what it's like to have that weight of conviction fall on you immediately. 
See, we, we, I'm not going to raise hands. You, we've had the, man, shouldn't have done that. Like, like God, God ain't pleased with that. Um, and that conviction is the Holy Spirit's way of leading you to a place of change. Right? So you say to yourself, I'm, I, I don't want to feel that way again. Because we all know a guilty conscience can wear you out. Amen. Amen. A guilty conscience will keep you up at night. God knows how to get you in the midnight hours when there's nowhere else to run to and make you feel the weight of conviction. So what the devil wants you to do is to keep doing it. Because the longer you do it, the less convicted you are. And eventually you reach a place where you're no longer convicted, you're no longer changing, you're just coping with it and saying, this is okay. Right? So it goes from, man, I feel convicted about fornicating to, well, I'm making love with someone. Right? right? The mind has changed. Right? You've labeled it differently, and now it's a loving act and not something that God is displeased with. So now you're learning to make peace with it. And when you learn to make peace with it, the enemy's got you. Because now you're not convicted any longer. You're not going to try to change. Now you're just going to try to cover it up. Um, and he knows that you're no longer where the Lord wants you to be. So I came to the conclusion this year, looking at my own life, that the best resolution to make is not to try and do something new, but rather stop doing something old. Right? That the, the best change you can make is not to make some promise that you're going to the gym, not, I mean, that's good. Don't get me wrong. You ought to be healthy. But for many of us, the issue is not adding something new. The issue is stopping something old, facing what's inside of us. And making a change within yourself is one of the most difficult yet rewarding things to do, right? To stop doing something, to reach a place where you can be like Paul and acknowledge there's something I shouldn't do and actually find victory in not doing it any longer. But making that change requires that you face what I consider to be the greatest enemy of your life, yourself. Facing the giant of your past, of your habits, of your behavior, of your lifestyle. And how do you face that giant? You know, I, I never used to like the cliche, but it is true. The greatest enemy is in me. My greatest struggle is really not with you. Because once I can win the victory over my own self and my own thoughts and my own actions and my own mindset, you're easy to deal with. Right? A person who's got their stuff together has no problem dealing with you. Right? How do we face the giant within us of who we used to be, of what we used to do? How do you face the giant of who you were since the day you were born to 2017 and three days ago you made a decision you're going to change that person? That's a major obstacle you're facing. And although it may seem very Sunday school-like, the passage that the Lord placed upon my heart is one that we've read, we've talked about, we've looked at as children, the battle of David and Goliath. It's about facing giants, about facing problems that are bigger than us, about facing things that we cannot handle in our own strength. And from David and Goliath, which you read about in 1 Samuel 16, I want to share with you uh, 10 steps to defeating the giant that's within you. And by the giant within you, I mean that very thing you know the Lord is calling you to stop doing. The you you've looked in the mirror at in 2017, the you you know God is calling you to change. How do we defeat the giant that's inside of us? How do I walk away from this lifestyle? How do I change my mindset about this? How do I find victory over who I used to be. Ten very quick steps, uh, right from the story of David and Goliath. I'm going to encourage you to reread it when you get home. One of the very first things I want to suggest to you is that you've got to see yourself victorious in this battle before it even begins. Amen. You've got to see yourself as being different even when you're not different yet. You've got to have a vision of yourself that is different. Watch what happens in the David and Goliath story. It's always one of my favorite points. David shows up on the battlefield, 
Goliath comes out and makes a challenge, and all the men of Israel are afraid. They're shaking, and they literally are hiding from Goliath. When David sees them shaking and hiding, and sees Goliath in the valley, and hears the challenge, he sees the men of Israel afraid, and this is what David says, what do I get when I beat him? Yeah. Yeah. You miss it. He sees what the battle is going to be. He sees that some people are afraid and shaking and saying nothing. And David's answer is not who's going to go, not how am I going to win it. David says, what do I get when I beat him? That I've already seen the other side of the battle before it even begins. And I know that I am victorious before the battle even begins. It starts with me believing that I can make the change. That no matter how long you've been what you've been, no matter how often you've done what you've done, there's an old saying, if you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can, you're right. It starts with how you see it, how you see yourself to be able to declare I'm victorious. Now to see victory as you face giants within yourself requires two things. Number one, it requires that you silence the discouraging voices of your past that say you can't. Because whenever you believe that you can fight something, you can change something, there's an old you that says, girl, we've been here before. Brother, this ain't the first time you made that promise. This isn't the first time you said you're going to make a change, and you've got to silence those voices. And the only way to silence them is with positive confession. Let me tell you something. You've got to learn in this battle to talk to yourself. Can I give you a side order scripture? How many of y'all remember the woman with the issue of blood? Just, just act, act, act like you did, act like you did. Mark, Mark 5, Mark 5, Mark 5. Right. There's a woman with the issue of blood, right? And you know the whole story. She reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and her menstrual cycle is dried up, and she's made whole immediately. But the Bible says, while she's moving through the crowd, she says to herself, if I touch his hem, it's going to be all right. She's talking to herself. She's telling herself, I got to get to Jesus. I know others are telling me I shouldn't be out here. Others don't want me out here. But I'm telling myself, if I can do this, everything will be all right. You have to learn to talk to yourself. Talking to yourself doesn't make you crazy. Answering yourself does, but talking. <laughs> but, but, but there's something about the power of positive confession. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, as I think, so am I. That, that what, I, what I envision, what I see, what I believe in my heart and in my head determines who I really am. And some of us are defeated before we even try to face the giant inside of us because we believe that we can't do it. I've been this way so long. I've messed up so often. I've gone down this road so many times before. But now is the day to start saying, but I'm going to be victorious this time. No matter how many times I failed, how I think determines how I perform. I noticed this today with my oldest son. Um, he's getting ready to apply for high school, and he took um, the SSAT, the secondary standardized, the secondary school application test, whatever it is. And he doesn't test well. He's not, he's not, he has test anxiety. So he didn't do the best on this exam. And so the school that's recruiting him for basketball called and said, listen, we want you. We just need you to get this score up a little bit. We're going to ask you to retake the test. So they told me, and I knew immediately I was going to have a problem. Because the minute I tell him he's got to take the test again, I know it's going to happen. He's going to be defeated in his mind. And the minute he's defeated in his mind, his score is going to drop no matter what. So I was in prayer all afternoon. Lord, I need you to share with me the best way to get him to see this as an opportunity to face that giant and to know that he's going to be victorious. And so I went into it with a whole different mindset. I said, hey, listen, I want you to know your grades are going up. Everything about you is smarter. I know you struggle in math. We're going to help you out with that. Listen, the school called. They want you. They promised that they would help get you in, that we're going to get some scholarship. You're going to play basketball for them. They just need you to get this score up a little bit. And they believe if you take it one more time, everything's going to go up. OK, Dad, cool. Good, good. Good. Point for dad, amen, we got it. Um, because I realize if you don't see yourself victorious before it begins, 
you've already lost the battle, right? So no matter what it is, no matter how long it's been that way, see yourself as victorious. Number two, very important that as you face this battle of the giant inside of you, whatever it is God is calling you to stop doing, the change you've got to make, you've got to let glorifying God be your primary motive. Okay. That I'm doing this to glorify God. Look at what David said. David comes down in this valley. He sees this giant. And he says, who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he would challenge the armies of the living God? That I'm going to beat him because God has to be glorified. That my primary motive in this is not Israel, it's not Philistine, it is God being glorified. That as you go about this, the change you're seeking to make is not simply to make yourself better. The change you're trying to make is not to impress your spouse or your boo. The change you're trying to make is so that God can be glorified in your life. That I tell myself that this is about God. I want God to be glorified in the way that my story is told about my life. And I'm not going to give up until the Lord is glorified. Because if you think it's just about you, you'll quit easily. Listen, trying to impress someone is not enough motivation to change your life. Because eventually you'll find someone who just accepts you as you are. But what I want to do is glorify God. So watch this. When David, you all know David and Bathsheba, right? Again, act like you know that one. David and Bathsheba. When David is convicted about his sin with Bathsheba, he writes a prayer of conviction and repentance in Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, he says this amazing thing. He says, against you only, God, have I sinned. Now, that's amazing because he violated Jewish law. He violated Bathsheba. He violated Uriah. But when he's convicted, he says, against God have I sinned. Because David realizes the primary offense is that God was not glorified in what I've done. And until I make God my primary motivation, I'll never have enough conviction to really make the change. I've got to wake up and tell myself that if I keep doing this, God is not glorified. If I don't get this right, God cannot be honored. If I don't let this go, God is not evidenced in my life. You've got to put God in the midst of this. And tell yourself that my primary motivation is that I want the Lord to be glory. I want the story of my life to honor God. Amen. That if I keep messing this up, the providential plan of God on this earth is hindered by my disobedience. Yeah. That oftentimes I remind myself what's at stake here. The devil wants you to be selfish and think that it's just about the confines of your life and you don't realize God is doing something through you that's so much bigger than you. But if you don't get this together, God's story is hindered. God is using you for something much bigger. And I want God to be glorified, and that's my primary motive. Number three, remember that you're not fighting alone. And that you have access to the power of God through the Holy Spirit. You need to know you've got more power than this. Because if all you're relying on is your own flesh, you're going to say like Paul in Romans 7, Oh, wretched man that I am. I keep trying, but I can't win this by myself. So David steps in the valley against the giant. And this is what he says. I come to you in the name of the Lord. You come to me with a sword and a shield, but I'm coming to you accessing the power that God has given me to be victorious, and I come calling on the name of the Lord. You don't do this by yourself. What a shame to have access to the strength you need and never call on it. What a shame to have God standing by waiting for you to call on him and ask him to strengthen you in your weakness, and you never do it. You know, how many of y'all, like, anybody ever watch wrestling? Long time ago. Right? Yeah, right, long time ago, long time ago, right, right. <laughs> sure it was. Um, um, I used to love tag team. You remember tag team wrestling? You're in the ring, and as long as you can make it to your corner and slap high five with your partner, 
you can get out the ring and they jump in. Here's what God says about the giant you're facing inside of you. All you've got to do is access who I am and I will fight you. When the Lord says, I'll fight your battles, that's not just against your co-workers. That's not just against your cousins. That's not just against the enemies and haters in your life. When the Lord says, I will fight your battle, I suggest the Lord means I'll also fight your internal battle. I will give you power to access the strength you need to handle this. So you know one of my favorite scriptures is that, that always reminds me of this? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Write it down. You have to look it up. I'm going to tell you what it says. God will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able to endure. But with every temptation, God makes a way to escape that you may bear it. You know what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says in a real sense? God always wants you to win. God wants you to win this battle. God wants to help you come out victorious. God does not want to see you defeated. God does not want to see you slip and stumble over the same thing time and time and time again. God stands ready if you want to access it. If you're not ashamed to call on the name of the Lord. Brothers, sisters, there's something about reaching a place where you're not ashamed to pause and say, Lord, I need your help. God, if you don't control my mouth right now, God, I need you to take this desire from my heart. I've prayed for the Lord to let something happen to interfere with the plans I've made. When you've made plans, in that moment, and then you felt the Lord, you know. Because see, when you've made plans, it's hard to come back and say, well, God, you know, it's hard to throw God in it after, you know, after you set it up. And we keep it real, right? So I just, you know. Oh, you want to get holy now, you know, you were, you were holy last week when you told me to get the ticket, you know. Uh, so you set things up and literally prayed, Lord, I need you to run interference on this. I need your help. I'm a living witness to tell you, God, God can mess up your plans. Hallelujah. God, God can mess up plans if you're willing to access it and believe that he wants you to win. God's not glorified when you're defeated. God's glorified when you win. Number four, it's very important in this battle that you identify there's a spiritual component. Right, that there are are spiritual forces at work here. This is not just about your mind and your flesh. There's a spiritual battle going on. Yes. That's what made David so strong in that valley. He realized this is not about how big Goliath is. This has nothing to do with how many soldiers Israel has or doesn't have. This is a spiritual battle. And you already know from Ephesians 6 the importance of identifying spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 reminds us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers. Because if you identify the wrong enemy, you'll fight the wrong way. If you identify the wrong enemy, you'll fight the wrong way. This is a spiritual battle, which means that you've got to fight it in spiritual ways. Here what Paul says to the church in Corinth, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons we fight with are not in the flesh. This, this is not just about going to therapy and having a convicted mind and writing 10 things you're going to do on the wall and looking at them every day. There's got to be some spiritual accessing of power that you need to get through this because this is a spiritual battle. And if you think that this is just about your coworker, or is this just about that brother that's got your number, that sister that heats you up, then you've missed it. Because the devil, 
if you think it's just about him, and if I can just cut him off, then I've won. You don't know how many hymns the devil got. <laughs> brothers, brothers, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm a testify to this. If you turn down the seven, he's gonna bring the nine. <laughs> y'all, ain't, y'all ain't with me yet? So you claiming victory over seven. Thank you, Jesus. And here come nine. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> because it's not the fleshly thing. It's the spiritual. Right? And, and Paul is clear, this is a spiritual battle you're fighting. Right? So you can't just win this by thinking you've conquered flesh. This requires some prayer, some fasting some time in God's word, some worship. If the spirit is not strong, the flesh is always going to be weak. You got to fight this thing in the spirit. Number five, I, um, I'm about to be a bad preacher. Um, I couldn't find number five in David and Goliath, but I'm going to put it up here anyway. Um, you need an accountability partner. The people who surround you play a critical role in whether you win this battle or not. We typically have one of two groups of people around us, enablers or accountability partners. Most of us have people who enable what we're trying to stop, when in essence you need someone who holds you accountable to what God has called you to be. Enablers don't want to offend you. Enablers want to cover it and keep it quiet. Enablers are the friends who know you're doing wrong and never call you out on it, but help lie to your spouse. Right? Those are the ones who know it's out of order, but I got your back. I got you covered. And typically we measure faithfulness by how much dirt they want to keep quiet. And those are the people who would cause you to sacrifice God's will, God's plan, and God's destiny for a few moments of pleasure. But an accountability partner is someone who sees and believes in what God has called you to be and won't allow you to abort your destiny over something stupid. Accountability partner will call you out on your stuff. And I would suggest if you're going to win this battle, you need some people, some one person in your life who's able to tell you, you know that's not what God wants from you. Think about it for a moment. How many people in your life do you have who are bold enough to tell you that's not God's will? How many, and you know, here's the problem. Those people are typically a little bit holier than we are. And so we typically don't reveal our full selves to them. because you want to have the appearance of being holy with them. Girl, God is good. Hallelujah. Bless his name. You don't tell them what you're doing on Friday. You catch them at church on Sunday. And enablers are usually at our level or lower, so we feel better about who we are because we know that I'm righteous, and I'm a little ratchet, but I'm righteous, I'm more, you know, I'm a little bit more righteous than they are, and I'm less ratchet than they are, so I don't have a problem letting them know. An accountability partner is someone you can trust enough to know that they won't try to embarrass you or expose you, but they will call you out. I need someone in my life who reminds me, God has a call on your life, Howard. You can't, you can't do that. And for a bulk of my life, I was surrounded by preachers who enabled. And had to walk away from a lot of friends in ministry when I decided there are certain things I'm just not, I don't want to do. I don't want to call you when we share stories about women. Right? 
Like that, that ain't helping me make a change. I want to learn more ways to hide my dirt. I don't want to do dirt anymore. I mean, aren't you tired of that? You need an accountability partner. Oh, number six is a good one. It's going to take a minute, but it's a good one. I want you to make note of what made you stumble in the past. And by that, I mean, what was your pattern that led to the failures? Hear me. David's getting ready to go down in the valley to battle, and Saul puts his armor on him. And David begins to stumble with it, and he says, man, I can't wear this. This stuff makes me stumble. He's aware that there's a certain pattern that causes him to stumble because you don't just wake up and lose. There was a road that led to it. And the smartest thing you can do is identify the signs that you're on that road to a repeated failure that you know. The road is the same and you know what destination it leads to. So I've got to stop myself before I get on that road. Okay, let me give a real example because some of y'all are going to be like, huh? Uh, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to counsel a brother who confided in me a few years ago that he was struggling with fidelity issues in his marriage, um, that he felt horrible about continuously cheating on his wife, and he was convicted by it, and he wanted to make a change. And so we began talking about the road to recovery, how we're going to break this. And finally, it dawned on me in like our third or fourth time together that I had to ask him, since this has happened multiple times, what triggers it? You know, how do you find these women? And we start talking, and this is what we noticed. He was always responding to people sliding into his DM. All right? You, uh, <laughs> Huh? Was, just, you know, he, he, he posted pictures that attracted certain women, and they would send messages on DM like, hey, how you doing? He would allow it. Next thing you know, he's scrolling through their page, looking at all their pictures. They're DMing back and forth. Conversation begins. You convince yourself it's just cordial and friendly. Next thing you know, you're off DMing, you're texting, right? And after the texting is, oh, guess what? I'm going to be in Phoenix. You want to come? And it's happened. I said, so what we need to do is identify the pattern of the leads to the failure. And it starts with the DM, which means you need to shut down your Instagram. Right? If we're serious about making the change, we got to know where the failure starts. Okay? Um, a sister um, came to me with an issue, and I directed her to Judy because I'm, I'm uncomfortable um, dealing with some women around issues of sexuality in conversation as a pastor, because I don't always know if that's them trying to get pastoral counseling. Pastor, I just need you to pray for me. <laughs> so the sister was having um, problems with what she thought was an uncontrolled sexuality. She identified um, herself as um, having an addiction to sex and was convicted and wanted to break away from that lifestyle. And when Judy was speaking with me about counseling her, what I realized was that in order to fight the actual act, um, can, can we be real for a minute? We talk? Okay. She was um, masturbating to porn because she felt that that was a safer alternative to actually being with someone. I mean, to a certain degree, you're exactly correct. It's a much safer alternative. But the problem was she thought she was actually controlling the sexuality by masturbating to porn, not recognizing that actually in actuality, you're feeding the beast, right? You, you've not shut it off. You've not starved it. You know, you're just giving it an appetizer, right? 
And so what we identified is that if you're really gonna make a change here, what triggers you is the porn. And so you've gotta get off the porn. Because the porn is putting it in your mind and then you're weak when the real opportunity comes. Because no, no one wants that over the real thing. You've never controlled the desire, you just controlled how you act on it. Um, you've got to identify what triggers it. For many of us, we know um, that drinking late at night triggers things, right? Y'all so holy, as you <laughs> I'm the only sinner in here, right? Okay. <laughs> And one of the things that really helped, you know, in some of my own challenges facing my own giant was to acknowledge, okay, where, where, where's the pattern? Where does it start? What is the first move? And if I realize where the pattern starts, if I stop the first move, I have a better chance of being victorious against it because I know me. And I know where this leads. If I start doing this, it's gonna lead here. And if I get here, it's gonna lead here. So the best thing for me to do is just not to start, right? There's certain things and places I just need to avoid. Because um, what the devil will always try to do is convince you that you're strong enough, right? That you, so here's the line that you're not supposed to cross, right? The devil tells you, get as close as you can and you know, it's fine, you know? Y'all can cuddle and snuggle, it, you know, just, it's fine, right? Okay, cool. Ain't nothing wrong with sharing a glass of wine and watching Netflix, it's, it's fine. <laughs> right? But here's what Paul says. Paul says, when you see the lion, run. <laughs> right? Paul says, get as far away. He says, flee, run as far as you can, because the devil's way is to make you think you can handle it. Right? Get as close as you can, and next thing you know, it's behind you. Paul says, flee, know when it's starting, know when it's about to begin, and go in the opposite direction. Because by the time you get too close to the fire, you're already burned, right? Run the opposite direction. What's your pattern? Number seven. At some point, you have to make a decision. You're just going to start. I'm going to start making my change right now. This isn't something I'm going to keep contemplating. It's not something I'm going to keep reading about. Today, right now, I make a decision to change my life. Now, the frustrating thing with that is that it doesn't happen overnight, right? Who you've been for 30 years, it doesn't change all of a sudden. But what I do believe is that you only fight and win one battle at a time, one day at a time. Make a decision to start. I don't know why people always use New Year's Day as the day to make a decision to start. I mean, if, if you got a bad habit you need to break, why wait three more months? To st start now, right? Start, start to January 3rd, I'm making a decision. I'm going to stop such and such, and I'm going to win it one battle at a time. So here's how this plays out. Let's say my challenge is smoking, right? Let's say I smoke, and I'm, I'm making a decision that in order to glorify God, I'm going to stop smoking. Now, that doesn't mean with that decision that the desire goes away. It just means that the decision has been made. And here's what I promise you. You can't quit three weeks at a time. You can't quit three days at a time. You can't quit one day at a time. You know how you win this battle? One urge at a time. So my first step is to say, Lord, it's 8.55. Please get me to 9.15. If I get to 9.15, I can make it to 10. Then I'm fighting it with small victories. Because the frustrating thing is that you may have done something for 20 years, and all you have is 20 minutes of victory against it, and it seems like that's just unfair. That doesn't weigh out well. You've got to learn... Number eight, to recall and recite your victories. If I made it through one day, I'm going to thank God for it. Okay? We had a, um, uh, a co-worker in the office who was going through a struggle of quitting smoking, and she came in and gave a testimony 
um, and said, you know what, I've, it's been 12 days since I had a cigarette, and I made everybody stand up and clap, yeah. right? right? She's been smoking for 30 years, and I know it ain't been 30 years that she's been smoke free, it ain't been 30 months, it ain't been a month, it's been 12 days, but we're gonna celebrate the small victories because every small victory you celebrate gives you confidence and courage to know that God's given me the power and that if I've come 12 days, I can fight the next hour. I'm not gonna give up on 12 days of victory for one hour of smoking. So the more you celebrate your small victories, the more you say, whoo, I, I made it through that, I didn't call. Holla, ooh, I ignored his phone call. Thank you, Jesus, I made it through one night. I'm, I'm gonna start, ha, huh? hey, hey. So, you know, you got, you ble bless his name. No. Every small victory counts. So David is getting ready to fight Goliath, and everybody around him is telling him he can't do it. He said, listen, I beat a lion and a bear. Now, the lion wasn't Goliath, the bear wasn't Goliath, but heck, I'm not coming to this thing cold. I've got some small victories behind me, and you're not going to talk me out of facing Goliath when I know God has already given me victory over a lion, and God has already given me victory over a bear. If God gave me victory over Friday, I'm going to make it to Monday. If I got a month behind me, I'm going to make it through two months. I am acknowledging that God has given me small victories, and you can't discourage or discount my small victories. It may not mean a lot to you. And the tough part is the people who've known you for 30 years are the ones who don't believe you. Listen, you're not doing this to make them believe you. You're not doing this to prove to them. Baby, bump them if they don't believe that you've got victory. Listen, I got to do this one day at a time. And if I can't convince you that I made a change, then that's too bad. Don't be discouraged by people who don't believe you. I'm not doing this for you. Because reality is that there's some people who will never believe you've changed. No matter what you say to them, no matter how much you try to prove it. So stop trying to prove it. The only person you need to prove you've changed to is God. And I said to you all in a Christmas sermon, when Joseph doesn't believe that Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit, God showed up and convinced him. God will speak to the Josephs who don't believe. Right? And remember this from that sermon. If God doesn't speak to Joseph, you don't need him. If God doesn't persuade them to believe, at least in the sincerity of my desire to change, then you don't need him. Because at a certain point, Mary, you can't argue your case to Joseph. Because Joseph won't understand it. Joseph won't believe it. You have to leave that with God. I'm giving this up. If you don't believe me, the Lord will have to prove it to you. But what I'm not going to do is be discouraged because you don't believe me. Amen. Amen. Hurry up. Let's get out of here, Pastor. Let's get out of here. Number nine, right? We're on number nine. This goes along with what we were just saying. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Be prepared to be prepared to be misunderstood. That one of the quickest ways for the devil to discourage you in making a change is to surround you with people that want to mock your intentions. So David says, I'm going down in the valley. Everybody around, man, you can't do that, you little boy. Goliath mocks him. You coming at me with a, some rocks and a sling? What are you, crazy? Whenever you are sincere about making a change that glorifies God, it's going to cost you something. Reputation, friends, people's opinion of you. Because people find it hard to believe that someone who's been outside the will of God for so long in a certain area, now all of a sudden is going to walk right with God. And I bet if, I, if you've had the experience I have, it's hard to go back to someone who you've enjoyed sin with and tell them you're not saved and giving it up. That's a hard conversation to have. It's hard because you're acknowledging that I wasn't right, and if you're still in it, it's convicting you. Right? And that's going to make you uncomfortable. For me to say to you, God doesn't want me to live like this any longer. It's going to cost you something. You can't sincerely make a change in your life and keep the same circle of people around you. Right? Anytime you make a sincere change, so the list is going to get cut. Right? 
You're going to be misunderstood. The final thing. I want you to believe that every day you get up, God is not only giving you a new day, God is giving you another chance. Which means this. If I've been that way for 30 years, tomorrow's a new day with a new opportunity to be a new me. The Bible says that every morning we we wake up, we wake up to new mercies. That God has forgiven and God wants to give you another chance on Thursday yes. to do what you couldn't do right on Wednesday. So that's, that's, why, that's why I say this, because along the road to change, you may stumble. You may fall off the wagon. You may not be perfect. Don't let the devil keep you there. The very next morning is another day and another chance. Let me give you some scripture to go home on. Micah chapter 7, verse 19 says that God takes our iniquities and casts them in the sea. He drowns them in the depths of the waters. Isaiah 43 and 25 reminds us that God blots out our iniquities. The term blot out, it's almost like having ink on a paper and putting white out over it. We're blotting it out. We're removing it. We can't see it anymore. We won't read it anymore. It's been blotted out. Psalm 103.12 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. Watch the metaphor, east from the west. Interesting, the Bible doesn't say as far as the north is from the south. The reason being is because the way the earth rotates, there's a north pole and the south pole, which means that there is a measurable difference distance between the north and the south. North pole to south pole, there's a distance. It can only go so far. But there is no limitation of east as west. No matter how far east you go, you still got more west that can go, which means that God infinitely moves our sins away from us and puts them so far from us that we don't have to live and act like we're still the same person because God has taken it and moved it so far to suggest, I don't ever want you going back there. That's how merciful God is. That's how loving God is. That all of my faults, which means I really, I really don't allow you to guilt me any longer because I know that God has removed it so far from me that you can't make me believe it's still right here next to me. So I really don't care what you think or believe. I know that I have been forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says this, God is faithful. And if we confess our sins, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. And if we confess our sins, he will cleanse us from all. God is faithful. And he will cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. So the things I left in 2017 are so far removed from me that I don't have to live like I'm that person anymore. He is a faithful and forgiving God. And you can fight the giant in you if you make some of these deliberate decisions to declare I will be victorious to get yourself some accountability partners, to believe that God has given you a new day and another chance. You don't have to be who you've been. So here's what I'm going to do as we close in prayer. I want to do exactly that. I want to pray, and I'm going to ask a favor. In a moment, I'm going to ask all those who want to join in a prayer of fighting the giant inside of you to stand. And if that's not you, you can remain seated. And there's no judgment about those who stand and those who remain seated. This is about this private battle that I'm fighting to win against the giant inside of me and make a change in my life. If you know that you want to glorify God in your life, that you want the narrative of your life to match God's story of your life, 
if you want God to be glorified through your victory over this giant, I'm going to ask you to stand and let's pray. Everyone who's fighting a battle, won't you bow your heads? Lord, like my sister, like my brother, I stand tonight because you and I know the giant enemy that is in me. You know the area in my life where I've continued to stumble. You know my testimony like Paul that every time I desire to do good, evil is present. And Lord, I come before you tonight acknowledging that I can't win this battle simply by being convicted in my mind but that I need some help. And so I'm calling upon the Holy Spirit right now as I make a decision this night in this place that I am going to change my life. I don't mean that to just be words. I don't mean that just to be things that come from a convicted mind, but God, I mean it to begin a journey where I believe that every day, every moment, you will help me be victorious. For somebody, oh God, that victory means, Lord, just get me through tonight and in bed. For somebody, it means, oh God, when I wake up tomorrow, allow my mindset to be different. Allow me to know, oh God, I am not defeated and that on Thursday morning, there are new Thursday mercies that are waiting for me to walk in and know that you're giving me another chance and that I can be victorious in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to pray that you would silence the discouraging voices that are even inside of me. Lord, send the right partner to my life to hold me accountable in my walk that I might share with them where I'm weak and know that they won't judge me, they will pray with me, and they will help me to walk upright in your sight. Lord, I'm tired of living the way I've lived, and I'm making a decision right now to start. I'm going to celebrate my victories. I'm going to give you the glory. And I'm going to thank you every chance I get. Now, God, walk with us that our lives might give honor and glory to you through the victory we have over this. I will defeat you in the name of the Lord. I will be victorious in the name of Jesus. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Lord, this is my prayer as I now stand against this giant. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. And the redeemed of God who trusted and believed in God said amen, amen, and amen.